Welcome to this section, where we will give an introduction to Bayesian statistics. Besides being one of my favorite subjects, the theory of Bayesian statistics also underlines all the nonlinear filtering and sensor fusion methods that we will present in this course. Although you can easily spend years studying all the facets of it, our aim for this section is to give you a basic understanding of the concepts which Bayesian statistics is built upon. In this first lecture, we will focus on giving you more of an overview of the subject without going into too much details. So, what is Bayesian statistics? Well, it's a statistical inference framework, which means that we can use it to make decisions or draw conclusions regarding some parameters of interest using data where there's typically some inherent uncertainty in the data. A typical example is that the data is imperfect and noisy and can thus not give us exact information regarding what we are interested in. Instead, we want to use Bayesian statistics to try to extract as much good information as possible from our noisy observations. In many ways, Bayesian statistics is a very flexible framework which can be used to form many different types of decisions. For example, the same basic theory and methods can be used for estimation, classification, detection, and model selection, and so forth. The key characteristic being that whatever problem that we are facing, the unknown quantities are described as random. This could, for example, be the type of disease of a patient, the transmitted message in a communication system, the temperature in a cylinder in an engine, or the intention of a driver in a traffic situation. To make things a bit more concrete, let's look at using Bayesian statistics in a medical application. Let's say that we want to analyze the disease of a patient. In this case, the quantity of interest that we want to apply Bayesian statistics to try to make a decision on is the disease of the patient. Let's denote the variable that describes the disease as theta. To help us make decisions regarding the disease of the patient, we make some observations. And we make these observations by collecting and analyzing blood samples, taking the temperature of the patient, collecting comments by the patients on experienced symptoms, and so on. In many cases, not one of these alone will give us the conclusive answer to the disease of the patient. But if we weigh them together, the picture usually becomes a bit clearer. And we can use Bayesian statistics to do this. An important aspect of Bayesian statistics is that theta, the disease of the patient in this case, is described as random. So it's a random variable. By doing this, we can calculate the probability distribution of the disease of the patient based on the observations that we have made. For example, we can make statements like, based on our observations, the patient has disease X with 97% probability. A possible concern that one can have regarding the Bayesian way of viewing things is whether it's actually valid to say that the disease is random. Surely the patient has gotten a disease and not any random disease. However, there are many advantages with viewing the disease as random. For example, in many situations, we will not be able to determine with 100% certainty which disease the patient has. By then viewing the disease as random allows us to also express our uncertainty in which type of disease the patient has. For example here, perhaps it's 97% probability that the patient has the flu, but with 3% probability it's just a common cold. When deciding on appropriate action, it's surely beneficial to know with which certainty a diagnosis can be reached. And could you come up with any other advantages? Let's look at another example where it's common to use Bayesian statistics and which we'll use as an inspiration for many of our examples in this course. And that is automotive examples. In this case, we look at self-driving vehicles, which rely on the ability to position surrounding vehicles in order to selfly navigate its surroundings and not cause accidents. So let's assume that we have a self-driving vehicle which is equipped with a bunch of sensors that observes the traffic situation in front. The quantity of interest is then the relative position and velocity of the other vehicles at the current time. So we want to know the relative position and velocity to all of these vehicles here. To do this, we'll make use of noisy observations from the sensors on the self-driving vehicle. This could be wheel speed sensors, 
or inertial sensors such as accelerometers and gyros on our own vehicle to measure how we are moving. But we also need observations that give us information about the position of the other vehicles. This could, for example, be radar detections, which gives us the distance and angle to objects, or LiDAR point clouds, or camera images, and so on. One aspect that I would like to highlight with this application is that, based on statistics, vehicle motions are modeled stochastically. That is, we describe likely movements of the vehicles using stochastic models, which helps us rule out unrealistic trajectories. If we look at the scenario here, in a Bayesian perspective, we would say that it's likely that this vehicle here moves something like this. That is, it is following the road more or less. And it's unlikely that it will make a sharp U-turn like this. Now, one possible concern one could have is whether a vehicle's motions actually are random and this underlines the basic Bayesian assumptions. For completeness, we should mention that there are two main strategies to decision making. Using Bayesian statistics, which we will focus on in this course, and using frequentist statistics. The main difference between these two are mainly on a philosophical level, but which also has consequences on the actual calculations that are made and the models that are used. So in frequentist statistics, uh, the quantities of interest are described as unknown and deterministic, and not unknown and stochastic or random as in Bayesian statistics. As a consequence, in the medical example that we discussed earlier, a frequentist would not state that given the observations, the patient has a flu with 97% probability and a common cold with 3% probability, but would rather say something like, based on the observations, the patient most likely has the flu. And the difference is that for Bayesian, the answer is a probability distribution of the disease based on our observations, while for a frequentist, the answer is the most likely disease based on our observations. Let us look at another example and try to highlight the difference between viewing the quantity of interest as unknown but deterministic compared to unknown and random. Let's say that we wish to estimate the height of the Eiffel Tower. Is the height random or not? Well, in a frequentist perspective, the tower has a certain height, and it's therefore not random. That is, it has some fixed but unknown value. Using the Bayesian perspective, we describe our uncertainties in the height by viewing it as a random variable with a certain probability distribution. In a sense, describing the height as random becomes a useful tool to incorporate prior information that we have about the height of the Eiffel Tower before we make any observations. I encourage you to think about this yourself. What do you think makes most sense and why? If you're not fully convinced that the Bayesian perspective makes sense, I hope that they will be able to convince you during this course. I should also mention that in many cases, the frequentist and the Bayesian would end up with the same answer, but there are also many cases where they would disagree. We will now leave the frequentist perspective and focus our attention again on Bayesian statistics by giving you an overview of the Bayesian strategy. So suppose we wish to estimate some quantity of interest, we call this theta, given measurements on theta that we call y. The key steps in Bayesian methods is that we first model everything that we need. In this case, we need two models. The first model describes what we know about theta before making any observations. And we do this using what's called a prior, which is this distribution P of theta. In the example of the Eiffel Tower, we would here say that we know that the height of the Eiffel Tower is somewhere between 250 and 350 meters. And we would describe this knowledge using our prior distribution, like this. So this is some prior knowledge that we have about the height of the tower before we even make any measurements. The second model that we need in this case is a probabilistic model of how the measurements y relate to theta. And we do this using the probability density of y conditioned on that we know theta. Note that as we're often interested in this as a function of theta, and that this is not a probability density over theta, but over y, to make this clear, we call this the likelihood of theta. The second step is to make a measurement update, where we combine what we knew from before, from this prior, 
with our measurements, uh, which is described by this density, which we also call the likelihood, right? We summarize our knowledge about theta in what's called the posterior density, which is the probability density of theta after we observed y. So y is now known. Our observation is now known. And the final step is to make a decision regarding theta. In the example of the Eiffel Tower, we would like to make a point estimate of the height. That is, we would like to decide on one value of the height instead of having this distribution of the height. In general, we do Bayesian decision making by taking what we know about our parameter theta, as described by this posterior density, and combine that with a loss function that describes what are important aspects in our decision. The goal is then to compute an optimal decision that minimizes the average loss over possible values of theta, as described by our posterior density. In the Eiffel Tower example, we typically would like to find an estimate that is either the most probable height or the estimate which, on average, if we do this multiple times with new measurements every time, has the lowest error. We call this the MAP and the MMSC estimates, respectively. And we will look at the loss functions for these in a later lecture. So in this course, we will mainly focus on the second step. But we'll also discuss how we derive our models and look at standard ways of decision making. We wrap things up with a self-assessment question for you to think about.